I'm Matt McClure, and this is Currents. The leader of the Coptic Catholic Church celebrates Mass in Brooklyn. The unity in Christ's blood and the body will help us to support one another. Plus, he'll stop by our studio to discuss the situation for Christians in post-Mubarak Egypt. Even with the difficulties we still live now, we are happy to have finished with the, the former regime. And making the pilgrimage of a lifetime. World Youth Day proves that everything that the media has been saying that the Catholic Church is very much law. It is very much alive. Well, good evening. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. When you think of the Catholic Church, how easy is it to fit the world's largest Christian church, boasting well over a billion members and counting, into the confines of your local parish? Well, as we all know, the Catholic Church is bigger than that. In fact, look up the word Catholic in a dictionary, and one of the definitions you're bound to find is universal. And that was a concept that was on full display at this morning's Mass at Holy Name of Jesus Parish in Windsor Terrace. The Patriarch of the Coptic Catholic Church of Alexandria, Egypt, Cardinal Antonius Naguib, celebrated a historic Mass that many would be hard-pressed to forget as he shared his message of hope and love from afar. It is a great joy to be here with you in the Catholic Church and in our common faith. We were very happy that he was here and we were honored. He honored uh, all the parishioners, he honored the church and he seems, uh, he, can, he, he exudes a, a holiness, he really does. The first Egyptian communities here in here was in Brooklyn. But now they are not anymore, uh, they are very less in Brooklyn. They are now, mo they moved to Staten Island and New, New Jersey. But I think we, we have a mission to give it a, a testimony of our presence. The Patriarch is always a pastor and father. These days, hearing all of the news of persecution of the Christians, I think his presence may help. And his words is always touching. The situation of the Christians in Egypt was always difficult. The evangelization of Egypt, which was done by St. Mark the Evangelist in the beginning of uh, the Christianity, first century, was marked by persecution. The body of Christ. I had heard that he was coming to visit us. I didn't know much about him or his background. Um, I was very, very humbled to be part of the Mass, to, to uh, lecture for, the, for him at this Mass. And um, actually, I would like to go and find out more about the Coptic uh, Catholics. I think it's a, a very intriguing part of our history. The unity of faith, the unity of prayer, and the unity in Christ's blood and the body will help us to support one another so that we can transmit and share this love to the others in our world. We have a, a very diversified community here in um, Windsor Terrace. With his presence, we are all brought together. Well, stay with us when we come back. I will be joined in studio by his beatitude, the patriarch of the Coptic Catholic Church, Cardinal Antonius Naguib. We'll talk about the historic ouster of former Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak and the situation for Christians in that country. Stay with us. Well, for many people, watching the daily protests unfold in Egypt's Tahrir Square earlier this year may have been their first introduction to the country's small Christian Coptic community. In a rare display of harmony between the two groups, Muslims, who make up 90% of Egypt's population, joined hands with Copts to overthrow a dictator and bring democracy to the freedom-starved nation. 
But today it seems those first days and weeks of unprecedented unity are quickly fading into memory as Muslims and Christians sporadically clash in religious violence. So have the fruits of protest gone bitter for Christians in post-Mubarak Egypt? Well, to find out, I was joined earlier today in studio by Cardinal Antonius Naguib. He's the patriarch of the Coptic Catholic Church in Alexandria, Egypt, and he was fresh from celebrating Mass here in Brooklyn. Your Beatitude, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate your time. It is my pleasure. Uh, first of all, let our viewers in on a, a little bit of how the situation for Christians is looking right now in Egypt. In general, is it better now for Christians than it was under Mubarak or, or worse? Or can we really tell given all the uncertainty right now? Yeah. When I am asked this question, I usually say I want uh, to give uh, an answer in general for the country and uh, in, in uh, a special way for the Christians. Even with the difficulties we still live now, we are happy to have finished with uh, the former regime. Sure. Because in itself, it was a lasting regime, but that reaches a degree of uh, corruption and uh, authoritarianism of uh, the police and uh, a unique party. Officially, it was not a unique party, but in fact, it was. Sure. And uh, especially of a small group who are taking power of everything, political and finances, and uh, this was, was for their benefits. For so for the country, the population, we are happy to have finished with it. Sure. Coming now to the Christians, I can say that in the beginning, we were very happy with uh, the atmosphere that were reigning in uh, the El Tahrir Liberation Square in Cairo, where the forces of the revolution, the youth, were there and 18 uh, days, they could uh, obtain what they claimed for, and Mubarak left the government and uh, left the uh, power. Sure. And for a week later, the situation was so magnificent, and the relation Christian-Muslim, nobody was looking at that. And uh, we had a great hope that it will last. But after that, appeared some forces of radical Islamists who uh, claimed for a religious uh, st uh, state and uh, legislation. Mm -hmm. And it was in opposition to all the principle and uh, all the hopes and all the vision of uh, the starting and uh, the uh, aims of this revolution. And uh, from that moment, there is some anxiety mm. in uh, the heart of the Christians. Sure, sure. Mm. And, and of course, we saw a lot of these uh, attacks on, on churches yes. and, and things. Yes, some happened. In, in mm. the months after uh, yes. the Mubarak regime. Have those kind of subsided now, or are we going through kind of a uh, more quiet time as far as those go? I thank God that I left Egypt at the beginning of this month and uh, from the uh, from January 25 to the beginning of this month of this month uh, several uh, conflicts and attacks against the Christians and the churches happened mm. and some of them were really serious mm. as you know from the media sure. and uh, I am glad and uh, thankful to God that uh, since the end of last month until now, so a, a complete month, I did not hear about any new accident or attack. So I hope that it will last really for the future and become uh, better and better. Sure. Mm -hmm. What has to happen uh, as far as um, government leadership? for that to occur, for, for uh, stability and security, not only for 
uh, all of the population, really, but, but especially for Christians, because it's such a small minority of the population in, yes. in Egypt, about 10%, I believe, of the population. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, so, so what has to happen as far as government um, intervention, oversight, and security, that sort of thing, to really keep it that way, to keep it safe for everyone in Egypt? What is uh, what makes things very difficult that there are many, many groups of the population that are claiming for rights and uh, increasing and uh, making better their situation and repairing all the damages or all uh, what was uh, not done for them during 30 years, a whole regime and even before. Sure. And they want it immediately. Now, impossible. Right. The Christian are part of uh, this society. Sure. In the same time, we have also our, we can say, special position as a small minority. And as a small minority, we have always had some hopes and the requests that usually were uh, left uh, aside. Sure. And now we see that the government is ready to do something in order to answer to some of these requests. Well, so the, and and so they're they're responding to that, and there is Not good yet. good good change afoot at least oh, yes, in process for the disposition. Sure, that's a, v a great thing. Yeah, wonderful, and we're very grateful to uh, have you here. Thank you. It and is my pleasure. Thank and, and thank you for being here. Uh, thank you. Thank attitude. you really also for uh, this uh, meeting with you and uh, this possibility. Well, thank you, and we'll we'll look forward to having you back at some point in the future. Very. I much. hope. I hope so. Very much so. God gives me life. <laughs> <laughs> Never know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, stay with us. A top Vatican diplomat to the United States died last night. We'll have that story and the rest of the day's headlines next. Welcome back to Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Coming up in just a bit, as we get closer to World Youth Day, another pilgrim from the diocese gives us his eyewitness. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. Well, we start with some sad news. A top Vatican representative to the U.S. has died. The Apostolic Nuncio, Archbishop Pietro Sambi, died yesterday, less than a week after being placed on a ventilator, after undergoing what was termed delicate lung surgery three weeks ago. Sambi had been the Apostolic Nuncio to the U.S. since 2006. He accompanied Pope Benedict during the pontiff's visit to Washington, D.C. in 2008. U.S. Bishops' Conference President Archbishop Timothy Dolan said Sambi understood and loved our nation. It's sad news. We had heard about, uh, about 10 days ago that the Nuncio was gravely ill after what we had prayed was to be routine surgery. Uh, he's a great man. I have a special affection and fraternal esteem for him because well, I got to know him pretty well as Archbishop of New York. He's the one that, that called me to, to say that the Holy Father wanted me to be Archbishop of New York. He was a very lovable pastoral man. He had a big heart. Uh, I told him once that he reminded me of Pope John the 23rd, and he smiled, and he said, well, I take that as a, as a great compliment. So we'll miss him very much, and our prayers go with him. Sambi was 73 years old. His funeral is scheduled for next Saturday, August 6th, at the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. Well, in other news, representatives from Catholic Relief Services and the U.S. Bishops Conference are warning against cuts to foreign aid. The groups are concerned the cuts could affect victims of a severe drought in East Africa. According to a director at the USCCB, the House and Senate are considering a 29% cut in emergency refugee assistance funding. Well, meanwhile, the State Department is calling for the release of a pro-democracy priest in Vietnam. Father Nguyen Van Lee was arrested this week for what media reports said were his anti-government activities. He had been arrested back in 2007 and sentenced to eight years in jail for his pro-democracy activism. He was released last year for medical reasons after suffering a brain tumor and three strokes, but was taken back to jail earlier this week. 
From Cuba, a report says government forces there attacked a group of women at a Catholic shrine. Fox News is reporting that the women are the wives of political dissidents currently being held in jail. The women were beaten, stoned, and stripped to the waist outside the shrine of Our Lady of Caridad del Corbe in Santiago de Cuba. Well, meanwhile, a new report from the UK shows positive developments in the reporting of sexual abuse by priests since Pope Benedict visited there last year. According to Vatican Radio, the report from the National Safeguarding Commission shows a threefold increase in the number of victims who felt they were able to come forward to say they were abused. The commission's chair, though, says there is still more work to be done. Well, the parliament of the predominantly Catholic country of Malta has passed a law to legalize divorce. The move comes after voters there approved a referendum on divorce back in May. Malta was the last country in the European Union to not allow divorce. Well, meanwhile, divorce in New York State is up by 12 percent since no-fault divorce went into effect in October. That according to a report in the New York Post. The report says there were more than 37,000 divorces since October, compared with more than 33,000 during the same period a year ago. A new Gallup poll shows large majorities of Americans support abortion restrictions. 87% of respondents favor requiring doctors to inform patients about the possible risks of abortion. 71% in the Gallup poll favoring requiring parental consent for women under 18 who want abortions. 57% though opposed banning federal funding from clinics that perform abortions. Well, it looks like a ban on circumcisions will not be on the ballot in San Francisco this fall after all. A judge there ruled that uh, state law does not allow local jurisdictions to regulate healthcare professionals. The Archbishop of San Francisco had joined other religious groups in speaking out against that proposed ban. And the lives of Haitians were forever changed on January 12th of last year when the devastating earthquake struck their homeland. In the aftermath, many fled Haiti. Here in the Diocese of Brooklyn, St. Joachim and Anne School in Queens Village took in 13 refugees. And yesterday, those young people got the surprise of a lifetime. A baseball game at Yankee Stadium and a tour of the city with some of the team's stars. It was part of the Yankees Hope Week. That's an acronym, H-O-P-E. It stands for Helping Others Persevere and Excel. We had a chance to catch up with everyone at the end of their day at St. Patrick's Cathedral. When you think about it, the church is, is, in the, is in the business of welcoming people, and we're welcoming a special group tonight. We got about a dozen kids from Haiti who came over uh, with the help of the Diocese of Brooklyn and the Archdiocese of New York uh, after the tragedy, after the earthquake. And they're go, they go to St. Joachim and Ann School in the Diocese of Brooklyn. They love it there. And the Yankees, in their, in their charity week, were good to them. You know, it's, it's a situation where, being with this organization, we have a platform to reach out to people. And, um, you know, our hope is that people see these stories and they decide to give back to their own communities and, and donate their own time. And they said, you think we could bring them by St. Patrick's Cathedral? We think the kids would get a kick out of that. I said, you bet you. It's a blessing um, because... All of our kids, most of them are, are Catholics. He greeted them at, 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 at the entrance of the church. It was very moving. He hugged, he, he hugged each of them. When, when we see the kids tonight, we'll be reminded of the tragedy in Haiti. And boy, they got a long way to go to recover. The process for them, like I would say, they, they, at, at times they ask questions. They will come to you at times asking you, why did God let this happen? Come, come to you crying with the problem. So I think it will take, it will take them a long time. Until now, after almost two years now, they always, they're still in the process of grieving. I remember when I went there, you'll remember just a week after the tragedy in, in January of, uh, of 2010, I went down as chairman of Catholic Relief Services, and they said to me, as I left, I said to my brother bishops, I said, oh, how can I help you most? And they said, uh, come back in six months, and come back six months after that because that's when we're really going to need the help, when people start forgetting us, when we're gone from the headlines. So this might be another opportunity for us to recommit ourselves to uh, the Christian charity and the sacrificial generosity that that, that tortured country still needs. Stay with us. There is more Currents ahead. When we return, a personal story of preparation for World Youth Day. It's really not the cool thing to go to church. But with World Youth Day, it is a cool thing.
And finally tonight, we bring you the story of a journey before the journey of a lifetime for one World Youth Day pilgrim. For six months last year, Timothy Zappel laced up his sneakers to compete in the Rodale and New Balance Movement Challenge, hoping to race his way to the grand prize of a $25,000 donation to the charity of his choice. And naturally, he put his best foot forward for a cause close to his heart, the Holy Family Parish World Youth Day Fund. Now, reaching that finish line would mean uh, helping almost 30 would-be pilgrims from his parish join him in Spain for the mother of all Catholic young adult events. Well, over 200 miles later and some uh, potentially sore feet, Timothy Zappel will be one of 500 pilgrims traveling from the Diocese of Brooklyn to Madrid for World Youth Day. And he details his journey and his expectations in tonight's Eyewitness. World Youth Day proves that everything that the media has been saying about the Catholic Church is very much wrong. It is very much alive and strong. I went to World Youth Day in Sydney, Australia. I didn't really know what to expect. I heard stories from other people who have gone to a different World Youth Day. My brother went to uh, the one in Toronto and he told me it was like unbelievable and you know, that you just can't really describe it if you haven't been there. So I'm like, what are you talking about? So I ended up going in 2008 and he was absolutely right. You really can't describe it to someone who hasn't gone. People are thinking, so it's like a party for young adults and all that, but it's not. It's tons of young Catholics throughout the world who are coming to one location every three years to really express how they feel. There's really not, the cool thing to go to church, but with World Youth Day, it is the cool thing. Everyone, you know, is proud to stand up and say, hey, look at me, I'm Catholic, and I'm proud, you know, to be out here right now, you know, confessing my faith that, you know, I believe in Jesus and his works and God. World Youth Day is really centered around the youth of the church, so you can connect with everything that the, you know, the priest says or the bishops that, you know, come in to have morning catechisms for us. Uh, you know, the stories that they tell and the teachings that they're trying to get across to us, you really can connect to them because they're really geared towards, you know, us. You go to the field for the mass from the Pope. You do a 360 look and it, you just see people, people's heads go on forever. Wherever you look, like there's an endless sea of people who are there just to see one man, really, the Pope. On behalf of, you know, the World Youth Day kids from Holy Family, we like to, you know, have a special thank you to the parishioners of Holy Family. And luckily for us, you know, we do come from such a generous parish that they were able to support us, you know, both financially and uh, spiritually. And that goes from anywhere from helping us, you know, collect bottles for us to recycle or getting emails, uh, email addresses for, uh, you know, my running that I was doing with New Balance to try to win $25,000. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we started the whole New Balance uh, competition a little too late into the game. And if we knew about it earlier, we probably would have won it. We actually came in second. I'm definitely going to try to find a way to you know, be more involved and show, you know, the younger generations that even though I'm young, you know, I am taking a more active role in the church and that they too can do the same. And that, you know, you don't have to be older to do, to do something to help your parish out. So that's why I'm hoping to be able to come back from, you know, Spain and really take on that cause. Came in second place in the Movement Challenge. Man, I'm telling you, that close to $25,000 to uh, help his uh, parish out and help other uh, other young people go to, to World Youth Day as well. But uh, not, a bad, not a bad job at all. And he's going to get to go. And I'm sure, uh, as you can see there, he's really looking forward to it, as well as all the other uh, youth from uh, Holy Family. So we wish them all the best. Our thoughts and prayers will go with them. Well, that is it for this edition of Currents, but I must confess to being pretty excited about tomorrow's show. The winners of the I, Confessed Co I Confess contest join me to talk about their prize-winning entry. It's a, a video. You'll actually see a little snippet of it coming up here in just a bit. Until next time, though, be sure and visit us online over at CurrentsNY.net. You can also friend us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. There we are at CurrentsNY. 
For all of us here at Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Thanks so much for watching and have a great night. And we leave you now with some scenes from the winning I Confess video, Get Clean. That's love.